You're live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our channel. Uh, I'm Abhinav Muju, Managing Director of uh, AP Education Online. And today, along with our panel members, we are going to be discussing about COVID-19, how COVID-19 has impacted the assessment methodologies within vocational education. On our panel today, I'm joined by Dr. Hazel, based in Scotland, uh, who has been involved in teaching and management across both the further and higher education sectors. She has experience in academic and vocational learning in postgraduate education and vocational professional development. She has been involved in leading digital uh, learning strategies in further education and also in postgraduate education. I'm also joined by uh, Dr. Sulafa al Khatib, uh, uh, holder of a PhD degree in education management, leadership and policies. She works as an academic consultant in Dubai uh, in United Arab Emirates. Uh, she's also a researcher and a writer of different articles in uh, educational leadership, <coughs> assessment, and quality assurance. Uh, joining with me also, Jenny Lewis from Sydney, Australia, who is a CEO and consultant, providing advice on international education systems. She also provides leadership in teacher uh, professional development and learning implementations across Asia, Middle East, North and Southern uh, Africa. Also from Scotland, uh, Nadan Jamus, who is an engineer, lecturer, and e-learning coordinator. Also, uh, he's also a Moodle champion and Microsoft uh, innovative educator, expert, and a master trainer. Uh, Nadir is an advocate of e-learning and has presented at national and international conferences uh, on the merits of utilization of web-based technologies. And finally, I have Gina from Essex, England. Uh, she's a freelance consultant and a lecturer. And uh, when allowed to travel overseas, I can understand current situation. Uh, she helps develop vocational education in Central Asia as part of cooperation between government and the uh, UK awarding body. Uh, she's heavily involved in e-learning and online learning projects, developing and delivering training modules, webinars to national and international teachers. So uh, welcome to you all. And thank you for uh, taking the time to join us today <laughs> and sharing your valuable experiences. And for those uh, of you watching us live today, don't forget to like and sub subscribe to our channel. And if we have time at the end of the discussion, we will look to answer any questions you may have. So go ahead and type any uh, questions you may have in our chat room. So let me just start. Uh, I would like to start with uh, Hazel. Uh, Hazel, if I may come to you first, how has COVID-19 impacted uh, on the delivery of vocational qualifications uh, in the UK, particularly in uh, Scotland, where you are? I think it's been significant and ongoing. It's still developing. Um, to be honest, I think what it's done is it actually accelerated some thinking that's been going on. There's been various leading bodies uh, done significant research uh, about online learning and the importance of digital learning for everyone, um, particularly micro courses um, and continuous professional development uh, throughout the sector. What's happened though is, is now it's not an option, it has become a necessity. So there's been a very fast uptake uh, and adaption to that uh, across the board, but it's been done very rapidly. There are, um, I know that JISC has recently produced a report called Education Reimagined, um, and they're really advocating the legacy effect of this will be a blended learning, uh, mm -hmm. where we, you get the best of both worlds. Obviously, as the pandemic has been for so long, everything has now become completely digital. I think there'll be a legacy effect to that for the future, that the digital components will no longer go away. They, they are a, a valid and useful means of learning, teaching and assessment. And I think that will, will continue for the future. I, I think some parts of observed and face-to-face -face education will, will come back again when it's safe to do so. But there's been an enormous amount of learning and growing confidence for teachers, lecturers, and for students in engaging uh, with online activity. And that fits very well into the agenda of soft skills and flexible learning, where people may have their core skills, but they're also comfortable with communicating and completing tasks on an online basis. 
And I think across the board, regardless of career, the ability to engage digitally is something that, that is not going to go away. So there's been a huge learning curve in the pandemic period to, to digital assessment and, and digital learning. In some subject areas, it works extremely well anyway. And it can be, you know, it's very good for um, scenario planning, for communication skills, for you know, multiple choice uh, mm -hmm. assessments. It naturally works extremely well. That's very good for ongoing professional development and micro courses. So particularly for micro courses and short courses, it, it's, a, it's a great platform to do. Uh, and that I think is not going to go away. And in the further education sector and in the higher education sector, there's been a growth of short courses and courses that will remain digital uh, for the foreseeable future, I think. That, that's uh, really informative actually. So uh, 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 Sulafa, you're based in uh, the uh, UAE. So how do you feel that, how has COVID-19 uh, uh, impacted on the delivery of vocational and qualifications there? Uh, now, in fact, as uh, my colleague just mentioned, it has been quite good so far and it has proven some good impact. But we shouldn't forget, especially because like with the vocational qualification, the practical skills are quite important and interaction with individuals, which must be demonstrated and assessed. Apprenticeship trainees were, were facing difficulties, especially because in certain situations, they're supposed to be in actual places to prove their uh, abilities and the skills that they have learned. Uh, there, there are certain areas that they need to work uh, to do the group work situation. Collaboration is needed and the students are supposed to be assessed uh, or they are supposed to uh, be seen, overseen by person at some specific physical location and under certain controlled conditions. So there, those were areas that I feel that were quite um, affected at the time being, even though that uh, we have found uh, different solutions for that, but still it's not like being in a, in a real physical uh, location. Other than that, uh, we can still, um, there are certain studies going on uh, to prove the impact on educational outcomes and whether it was uh, quite affected or not, or we are still on the right track. And something that we uh, must forget from time to time is the student's well-being. Um, many studies are taking place now in the UAE about students' well-being and how distance learning has affected the students' interaction, the students' work, uh, their educational outcomes, especially uh, students with some uh, special educational needs those who need like one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one work, those who need uh, uh, direct support from their teacher and they need to be face-to-face -face with, uh, with their uh, support mm -hmm. assistant teachers. So that was an area that I feel um, it might have been a difficulty at the time being, even though that we're trying different solutions to try to, come, uh, to, to support like those students, or to look at the different uh, solutions so students' well-being wouldn't be affected. All right. So that's, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Sulapa. Uh, now, coming up to, coming to Gina. Gina, you are based in the UK, in England. So, how have you seen uh, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the delivery of vocational qualifications, you know, based um, on experience and, uh, you know, uh, current scenario? Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, um, I would agree with the points that have already been raised wholeheartedly. And I think Hazel mentioned a really good word, accelerated. It's almost like we've we've dropped into a an experiment almost, um, you know, mm -hmm. obviously for... Um, unfortunate reasons, but for many of us who've been um, sort of banging the online e-learning drum for many, many years and have seen um, quite slow progress in some areas have suddenly come to the forefront. And, you know, we're all uh, uh, learners and institutions are placed in a situation, um, as you said, Hazel, where they don't have a choice, really. Um, and what's really interesting to watch is that... Um, I guess because of that situation, people have become more creative and they are more um, inclined to experiment and, and try different solutions. 
not to say that that's um, you know doesn't have lots and lots of challenges. And I think um, uh, Sulafa, you you brought up some good points. It's probably as we go on in the future and we start to look back and, and reflect and review um, and, and take more research into what actually the impact of this has been on, on um, you know, learners and um, of course, teaching staff as well. Um, we're not really going to know, but um, I guess what I've seen in institutions um, is a, a desire just to get on with it really, <laughs> and to try and do their, their, their best for learners in, and try to adapt um, I think people are heavily um, reliant on uh, virtual learning environments um, um, and, and also Google Classroom. Um, those solutions that were already embedded um, in practice. However, I think they now realise that, you know, these, uh, these are um, fundamental, They're, you know, the, without these uh, um, technical solutions, um, really nothing can can um, progress. So I think um, people, you know, uh, I've been involved in sort of webinars and all sorts of things in terms of online and blended learning solutions. And quite a lot of the, the, the questions are not so much about how to use the technology and the features and, and so on and so forth. They're more about the, um, I guess, the pedagogy, the, you know, the... Um, the you know the teaching and learning the assessment um, practices um, and and that's no different to when we were in the situation with you know traditional face to face learning educational professionals are uh, very focused on you know um, regardless whether you you know you're standing in a classroom or you're uh, using uh, you know a, a virtual classroom or whatever they you know they they're interested to know how how that works in terms of um, pedagogy so I think that that really still underpins things. But I would also agree, I think um, there are many challenges and I think, you know, some of your questions later on focus on assessment. I think probably as uh, uh, Salafra has mentioned, that is particularly for vocational education, um, probably the greatest challenge area. And, um, you know, in some ways, um, because of the, you know, uh, situation in the UK, the lockdowns, et cetera, um, assessments have had to um, almost stop. I mean, you know, awarding bodies are, you know, have had to stop, um, you know, exams at uh, national level and look at ways of, um, you know, certificating students so that they aren't impacted. So in some ways, um, you know, there aren't obvious solutions in some things and, and um, you know, we, as, as Salafra mentioned, we can't necessarily replicate a, a practical experience um, through technology. Uh, there are things you can do, but uh, you, you know there is there are limitations. Um, so yeah. Thanks, thanks, Gina. Thanks. It's quite uh, informative, actually, and uh, definitely uh, a lot of our audience, you know, when they will listen, it, it's quite uh, knowledgeable. Now, uh, uh, Nadir, if I may turn to you next. How have you noticed uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the delivery of vocational education qualifications? Uh, immense. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to our session. It's, uh, it has been, I fully concur with all the previous speakers. They have expressed the situation pretty well. Again, here in Scotland, uh, we had to shut down in March, um, mid-March last year. Now, prior to that, uh, e-learning was seen as a sidestep. It was a branch separate from the rest of the teaching and learning. And only a handful of organizations and individuals were actually active with that. And e-learning was seen very much in terms of uh, vocational education, but for specific subject areas, mainly theory-based rather than vocational. E uh, vocational, but theory-based rather than practical. Uh, after the lockdown, we were all forced into uh, e-learning. We had no option. And I was inundated with requests for training all across Scotland from various colleges and universities because people had no choice. Lecturers had no choice. Teachers and other organizations, they had to take part in e-learning. And uh, the first few months was horrendous. It was a practice. It was a all by trial and error. I'm glad to say that uh, now that we've started in September again, um, people are much more confident, students are much more confident taking part 
and majority of the time, all classes are taught online. We are in Scotland, we are back into lockdown again. So again, we are using uh, Microsoft Teams, et cetera, and other platforms. Uh, but prior to that, we decided that we couldn't go back to norm. And again, in the future, once everybody is vaccinated, again, we will not be going back to the traditional classroom-based teaching. Uh, E-learning will be part of our teaching in the future and in years and decades to come. Uh, we struggled in the beginning to keep up with the technology simply because uh, we, we didn't need it. It was just something that we used as an extra option to enhance our learning and teaching. However, since the lockdown, it became clear that the technology couldn't keep up with our demands and we were constantly feeding back into Microsoft, requesting additional features, requesting additional add-ons so we could cope with the demand of e-learning. Uh, students don't really like it, teachers and lecturers don't like it because we don't get to see them face to face, we do not have that social interaction with them. Uh, asking questions is really difficult simply because uh, students, maybe 10, 20 of them, 30 of them in a class, they don't know when to answer, they all wait for another person to answer, so you have to uh, encourage them to come on board and uh, and also uh, they have to understand that now learning is their own responsibility. They're no longer in the classroom where the teacher can come around and show them how to do things. We can only show them online and then they have to take part themselves. So tutorials have taken a major step forward in terms of learning and teaching. Uh, and we will be carrying on with that. Thanks, thanks, Nadia. Thanks for your uh, 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 contribution. Now, uh, Jenny, you're based in uh, Sydney, Australia. So how has COVID impacted the delivery of vocational education here, qualification here? Yeah, so I think we might put a couple of things in context. Um, uh, we uh, took a strong and hard approach at the beginning of COVID. And so from seven of the eight states, uh, we were only shut down for about two months in our schools and our higher education systems, um, per se. Um, and one state uh, has the reputation of having the longest lockdown in the world because they took a hard stance uh, whilst there was a breach and were not at school from April until uh went back in August, I think. So, um, to October, sorry. Um, so we haven't had the lockdowns that you've talked about and the pre pre prevention of practice and assessments and teaching and learning to the same levels as many other countries here on, online. But in saying that, there's a bit of context to it. Um, yes, FIT was impacted. Um, and certainly the social distancing, the health pieces um, affected the delivery of some of the courses. Uh, there was a closure of borders, both international and uh, within our country. So some of our students couldn't come into country, let alone go across borders. Um, some of our industry has been dramatically affected, particularly hospitality, hospitality, health, um, and uh, where people and people to people functions have uh, been impacted. But it's growing other industries as well. Um, this was happening at the same time in Australia as we had had a major review of it. Um, we had found, uh, well, the Australian Schools and Qualification Authority had found in a massive review that um, VET needed to be reset anyway. Uh, so we only had about 51% of our 15 to 19 year olds actually um, completing courses and around about 50% of our students 20 to 24 years old completing their courses. So there was question marks about what was happening in VET anyway. Um, we also know that in 2019, only about 27% of our VET graduates were actually employed. So did we have the wrong courses suiting the wrong uh, workplaces for the wrong reasons has been part of what we're actually looking at nationally at the moment. So certainly ASCLA, our national authority has looked at some key points and we'll be discussing those tonight. Our system, assessment systems needed to be reset, and we'll talk about that. Certainly our quality training programs, um, the assessments, insufficient trainers, uh, differentiation of models between um, secondary schools, TAFEs, 
uh, blended university and TAFE partnerships. And there are 4,000 RTOs in between all of that had different models in place and we needed a quality standard. Um, so with that all happening, we also know that um, there was some riskness happening in this year, for example. So we do know that our RTOs were very agile and started new courses, but without the quality mechanisms that are required. We know some of our providers went to online very quickly. In fact, we have a thousand online at the moment, but without the right instructional practices um, to embed that as a quality practice. And we also know that our providers were not unable to provide learning in some situations in workplaces, but it wasn't a government limitation. So we actually have had to come back and look at that as well. So what COVID has done for us is really start to think about new business operations. And many of our businesses are looking at that rethink our curriculum teaching and learning and assessment practices. And most importantly, start to really think about what have we been doing that is really busy work and not learning work and reset a lot of our courses. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Jenny. Thanks uh, for your valuable input. Now, uh, I would like to move on, uh, uh, move the discussion on to remote assessment options actually. So now that if I turn to you first, uh, what type of remote assessment options could we use uh, uh, in the delivery of the qualifications? So if you could just you know, give an idea like a uh, few points and a uh, few remote options, that would be really helpful. You know. Yes, of course. Uh, remote assessment, we have to look at it from two points of view. Uh, there is the measure of learning in the traditional sense that uh, e-learning was about uh, showing the students how to do things, providing them with the knowledge, the notes, etc., and uh, we will measure their skill set through assessment. Uh, this was achieved in courses such as the one that you and I both deliver for the Diploma in Project Management. People work on life projects at their workplace. We teach them the techniques of project management. They apply that to their work environment. They write their assessments uh, and they submit it back to us and we mark them based on the criteria that is required. That was the easy part. And we've been doing that for many years now. Uh, so we, we are carrying on with that regardless as before. The other problem now is the vocational training in terms of the practicals. Now there we can no longer assess because uh, it's very much hands-on. So we are moving into measuring the achievement through the, rather than the skill set, now we are looking at competency based. So that is the challenge for us. How do, how do we do that? And the main challenge is for the people who are working uh, as apprentices, whether they're at workplace or coming to college, it's becoming much more difficult because the assessor can no longer be there and watching them and showing them how to take care of a process, how to adjust the process and, uh, for example, repair uh, a certain equipment. So now it, we are very much relying on the technology and we're using audiovisual in the sense that we say, right, uh, you can record your voice while you're doing the process, while you're taking uh, the job on, uh, at hand. You can take pictures and record videos. And then it is very much logbook based now. So they, uh, they input their data into logbooks. And as assessors, we can examine the logbook. We no longer assess, but we look at the assignments. So we are moving away from assessing to uh, competency-based ass uh, assignments. And again, uh, we are moving away in Scotland, that's the new uh, pedagogy, uh, SQA, Scottish Qualification Authority, is moving away from uh, lesson-based examinations to uh, project-based. So we no longer expect them in the future, in the years to come, we want to move away from students being able to remember and understand and just regurgitate the formulas and the information in an assessment paper to be able to apply and analyze uh, the results, uh, apply their knowledge into the real world situation, analyze their results and evaluate the process. So we are very much moving away uh, from assessment into assignments and into project based. Great, uh, especially this uh, getting the portfolio done by video evidence and photographs, that's, that's the, uh, one of the key things which nowadays a lot of people use as an assessment evidence uh, 
remote assessments. So, Jenny, what uh, what type of remote assessment options do you uh, see being used, uh, or possibly possibly being used in uh, delivery of these qualifications? Yeah, well, Australia is a big country, so we've had remote learning in place for a long time, and my understanding is that about fifteen percent of our students in VET are, are learning through remote pathways. Many of our children, primary and secondary, do their whole learning life online. So it's it, it's been, but it has been the reset. We uh, I believe um, has it's been the necessary disruption to really think about how we could be doing that. So yes, we can talk about things that are normal practice in in secondary schools. For example, um, uh, simulations, a range of things such as presentations, group presentations, which is encouraging students to use the soft skills that we've been talking about, written reflections, um, work, uh, the workplace simulations, um, getting uh, student to student online assessment of each other, peer reviews, um, really announcing in many, many ways the future skills that students have been practicing for a long time, but they haven't been formalized. But it does lend to us coming back to think about how we are designing these tasks. Um, so the really thinking about that, if we're going to develop the tasks this way, then the, the, they should be, what are the, the technical capabilities we need to assess them? Um, what, well, how are we going to manage and monitor the transform of these skills in the portfolio? Is it something that a student starts in secondary school, takes and it's their learning for life portfolio, and as they build generic skills and micro-credentials, they're, they're populated within this learning pathway. Some countries have formalised that as the way that they will document learning moving forward. But really coming back and starting to collaborate on what these assessments in and a sh uh, shifting the mindset of employer and some educators that having to watch it physically isn't always the best way to actually validate that student can do it. Um, and that mindset is part of the problem. And we actually have some employers here throughout our research saying that if I can't see it, they can't do it. So we it's, it's part of that methodology shift as well. But we do know that uh, we've got evidence already that students uh, completing assessments online are doing as well as, if not better, in their assessments than they were prior to COVID. So there's lots of great learnings out of this, but it's the design and then the delivery and then the collection of data and the recording of that that's got to be packaged in this assessment task. Yes, that's, that's it. Good option. Uh, Gina, do you have a different view on uh, what types of assessment options can be? Since I know you're in the uh, hospitality, tourism, and in that sector, it's like more of a practical observation and like, let's say it's called practical cookery or something like that. So there's more of practical assessments, practical observations. So do you have a different uh, opinion on that? Or uh, Yeah, I think one of the issues um, here in the UK is almost that we, um, as I mentioned before, we've almost been thrown into this um, experimental situation. And in some ways, I think um, from what I've seen is that teaching professionals are quite, are probably more um, um, enthusiastic about um, being creative with formative assessment and using various tools on, on uh, their VLEs or in Google Classroom. So, for example, you know, getting, getting engaging students to collaborate with, um, you know, um, and, you know, those features on the platform that allow them to um, do collaborative activities um, for a formative assessment. But I think when it comes to summative assessment, potentially there's more concern because you know, people, uh, teaching professionals have really, um, as Jenny mentioned, got to change their mindset quite quickly. And that's not so easy to do when you're talking about um, a summative assessment that you were last year or a few months ago doing in a very different format. And uh, there's, you know, lots of concerns and worries um, from teaching professionals. And in some ways they... Um, I guess maybe in in higher education there is more um, 
willingness and ability to uh, be creative with solutions because they, you know, higher education institutions have more control over their assessments. They validate their courses and, and write their assessments, whereas at lower levels, um, you know, we talk with, you know, national awarding bodies, etc., get involved um, and, and steer assessment. And it's not so easy for um, teaching professionals to, um, you know, rewrite things <laughs> very quickly um, and I think the solution at the moment in terms of the practical options are that a lot of that practical assessment um, has has actually um, been put aside you know it's almost been put on hold really until such a time as it can be um, re-established because um, you know we're almost you know maybe in a in a couple of years I think you know it, it, things might more be more embedded but I don't think at this stage people are um, able to come up with um, solutions that they're at, comfortable with um, purely because you know if you don't have access to um, you know the practical world, uh, environment and the students can't be face to face and so on and so forth they you know you can't really get around that um, um, but that, that being said, I think, uh, as Hazel mentioned, I think as, as we go forward in the future, things are going to change. And, um, you know, this will almost be this year or and last year will be almost be like a, a you know, a, a, a reflective exercise. I'm sure there's going to be many, many case studies written about it. And, you know, teaching professionals will be able to go and look back and think, OK, what can we learn about um you know how we can approach this and um, embed this these um, changes for the future so yeah I think there are you know there are lots of um, features on various platforms that allow students to have um, you know learning experiences where they collaborate with peers and so on and so forth and video evidence and all of these things are do exist um, but I think with vocational qu qualifications um, certainly when we're in lockdown one of the biggest barriers really is that they can't um, access um, either realistic working environments or real working environments um, and and that is you know that is a that is a big challenge it has to be uh, brought into the, like it has we have to focus on that when it comes to uh, you know, practical part of it, practical part of an assessment. We have sometimes they need equipment, sometimes they need simulations. So mm -hmm. that's one of the key things. So uh, if I may uh, ask you, Sulafa, what type of remote assessment options uh, can we use? Do you have, uh, like, from your experience or in UAE, as something different that has been used or something innovative that has been done? Uh, yeah, um, in fact, the UAE um, focused a lot on the different types of assessment. And they were, as my colleagues mentioned before, they were worried about the summative assessment in addition to the formative ones. The formative ones, it wasn't a difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, as it was, uh, as Nader said, we, we had the e-portfolio, we had the e-assessment, which is uh, easy to tackle. They came up with different programs so that they can control and ensure that it's in appropriate environment and there would be no difficulties for the students to work on. Uh, but uh, certain additional, like some creative options were also added to the the rich media resources, as also Nader mentioned, like animations, video, audio, and interactivity applications like Coach My Videos, which allow the users to like overlay an existing video with some commentaries on it, adding, proposing, putting comments for the learners so that they can work on. But what was quite uh, impressive is the addition of different forms of media, new forms of media that we all know we are all exposed to, like the virtual reality, the 360 photography and videos, or even the augmented reality. Some of them were used in classes for uh, during instructions uh, as supportive for teacher like augmented reality, where they would be able to show students any uh, work or uh, as, as it's in front of them, it would be enlarged with some comments, uh, like if they want to show them the different parts of a car, they can see it as if they are close to it, they are watching it, and they can look at the, diff the smaller details of it. The virtual reality was quite applied in a good way, like uh, they don't require the learners uh, 
they can put it on the computer. It doesn't need a headset. And students can interact with it, and they can move their mouse or the touch mm -hmm. screen and put notes. So it can be used as an assessment, as a summative assessment, and it's effective because students can put notes on the video and interact with it and see where's the difficulty, where's the, what are the different areas that they need to work on. So uh, learners were able like, to manipulate the objects that they are working on, moving it or putting it in different places just to show that they understand what they're working on. Uh, we, there are also certain cloud-based applications that allowed the, the learners to submit their materials through. They could do uh, some uh, group work, pair work, uh, uh, presentations through it. And of course, in addition to the different uh, learning management systems that were used, either by the Ministry of Education or by different uh, private schools, uh, depending on what they are uh, using as uh, platforms. Uh, and we have some kind of like screen recording for a summative and formative assessment that they have used or recording evidence, as my, uh, my colleague already mentioned. So in the UAE, we tried to come up with like different solution. They were all uh, tech-based uh, so that we can help as much as we can to uh, to come up with the appropriate summative assessment. We didn't want to miss that part because it was uh, our schooling did not stop at all. Uh, mm -hmm. We've worked all through the time since March. Uh, we didn't mm -hmm. have any um, um, problems with the classes, with the e-learning. That's why we had to come up with different solution for the formative and summative assessment uh, so students wouldn't have difficulties ending their school year in the proper way. Great, great. great, thanks. Thanks, Sulafa. Thanks for the, uh, the insight of uh, UAE. So, uh, Hazel, what's your view on that? It's interesting listening to my colleagues here talk about the, the range of assessments. And actually, there's a very rich range there. And, and it's bringing in a lot of skills, the group work, the portfolio management, the engagement with virtual digital technologies, and actually adding a whole suite of additional skills. Mm -hmm. to students over above the core skill that they're getting in, in the direct teaching. But I think one point Gina mentioned, which is very key, is, is mindset. Because I think we have grown to believe and just automatically think that exam-based and face-to-face and -face assessment is robust and solid. And we've got a huge amount of confidence in that. But actually, what COVID has done is, is made us think about a whole range of assessment types and formats and platforms that can actually be very valuable. But at the moment, I think that the recognition of that needs to grow and there mm. needs to be more confidence that, that these assessments are actually not just a second best, not just an emergency fallback, but there can actually be some really good positives in those. Um, because if you think about it, sometimes people say, well, they've gone and they do an exam and they, they, they swat for it and, they, and then they forget it all later. Whereas mm -hmm. if you are involved in project-based learning, the, the, the long-term long learning value can be much mm -hmm. more and the level of interaction is much more ongoing and developed. So mm -hmm. I think that there needs to be a, a greater awareness of the value that these things can actually bring in order for them to, to be given weight within the sector, rather than just seeing them as, as a fallback. Mm -hmm. And that, that needs time and it needs, I think the, the case studies, as Gina said, the reflections in this will be valuable, but I think they'll also be very important to get benchmarking of what these new forms of assessments mean and what the added value is and where that added value can be gained. Because there's so many bodies just immediately prior to coronavirus, we're talking about the importance of soft skills, the importance of team working and collaboration and project-based learning. And actually, this is a great opportunity to formalize those within the curriculum uh, and within assessment. But we need time uh, across all educational sectors to do that and reflect on the outcomes from that. Great, great. Thanks. Thanks, Hazel. Thanks. Uh, I would like to move on to the next question because this is something which, uh, uh, because it's about now the institutes who deliver qualifications and now they, they, they face a, a barrier. Now, how do they assess 
uh, do these use assessment techniques when they are doing remote assessments or the physical uh, uh, practical aspects are not there. So coming to this point, so uh, uh, how, how, how do we think that, uh, how can assessment methods be used effectively by vocational training institutes? So Hazel, uh, let me start with you first, actually. What, what's your thought on that? In terms of online assessment, I mean, there are some sectors already doing it, and a, a lot of project management courses can do uh, online assessment, and that, that works very well. I think, um, obviously, the, the immediate impact on assessments is going to be that there will be much more project-based evaluations that are now having to be done uh, rather than an exam. And in fairness to students who've had a, a, a moving state in their learning period, because it, it has been very dynamic and turbulent. Um, so there will be a lot of project-based assessments replacing exams in the interim. Whether that continues in the long term is debatable, but I think there would be a missed opportunity not to begin to factor in project-based assessments and assessment over a longer period of time with, with separate work submissions digitally and, and to look at how to do that creatively and in a digital environment. And sometimes I think with assessment, we fear being creative because we feel the outcomes won't be robust enough. And I think what we need from the higher education sector and the governing bodies for, for schools and colleges, which Scotland is the Scottish Qualifications Authority, is clarity on what those assessment outcomes should look like. So we need to do a bit of benchmarking and levelling so that we can advise assessors on how that should measure up and ensure consistency across the sector. I think consistency uh, mm -hmm. is a big thing, and that's what we need to ensure when we're looking at alternative modes of assessment. I think they've all got great potential, but we need to make sure with each vocational area, we, we have a format that assessors can work within comfortably and that they know that they're fulfilling the, the right criteria that has to be ensured. Okay, great. And uh, how about you, Jenny? What's your view on that? Uh, sorry, Jenny, I think you're on mute. No, there we are. Okay. Um, I think, uh, it, it's one of those things where we always put the cup before the horse and we need to come back and put the oxygen on, on the educator. Um, we, we know this, this area needs to, to shift uh, as is the rest of the world sh changing. And we know that vocational education is, is part of the backbone of the future economies that are still to be rebuilt. So uh, what has happened in a couple of places here in Australia and is a growing piece of work is it's all very good to us to talk about the formative and summative assessments that we would love our students to be doing. But if our teachers don't know how to do that themselves, then, then we've got a, a significant skills gap within, it, within our, our trainers. Mm -hmm. So as part of the, um, the lockdown here, um, some of our uh, education departments um, did some strong professional training in the areas of teaching teachers how to collaborate together online so that they could do that with their students, how to discuss and when do you use discussion and, and when do you use other sorts of attributes, how to give feedback and reflection online, when to do guided learning online, when to do an explicit learning activity online, how to demonstrate and present this in an effective mechanism, um, how to make and explore and do experiential learning or project learning as we've been talking about online. And what does that look like when you're nurturing independent learners? So a lot of investment was done in that. And there's a new piece of work emerging as well as we start to rethink, it's a major piece of research here on the methodology for assessment and recognition of the complex capabilities we've been looking at. So there's a development of a, a, a test framework coming out of Sandra Milligan's work at the University of Melbourne. And she's talking about how can educators together co-design and scope for purpose um, along the particular sectors or, or pathways. Uh, what does that look like as an assessment framework? Um, then co-design the assessments together so there's shared understanding. Um, design the report and the credential at the same time um, and think about the ways we've talked about assessing and the portfolio of learning we've been talking about. Then do small pilot and large pilot testing. 
So we're concurrently growing these amazing new students in a new world, but at the same time, uh, enabling our educators to walk alongside them and learn together at the same time. Both have to be done. Perfect, perfect. Thanks, thanks, Jenny. And uh, uh, do you know, what's your thought on that uh, in terms of vocational institutes? Yeah, I'm, I mean, um, again, I would agree with um, everything my colleagues have said, but um, one of the things I think that um, uh, this situation has really um, a allowed a, a greater opportunity for uh, personalization and differentiation of assessment, you know, something that obviously as educators we've been, um, you know, um, researching, trying, experimenting with for many years, prob probably more in the traditional setting. However, um, because um, um, students are in, um, you know, very different um, situations and, you know, um, some, won't, some will have difficulties of access, some will have difficulties of equipment, some will have difficulties with digital literacy, um, I think that, you know, some of the things that I've seen, uh, you know, we're a long way from, you know, it all being perfect, of course, but I think uh, teaching professionals are looking at ways of, you know, being able to differentiate and personalise and, you know, um, you know, for, for argument's sake, you know, if one, one student... Um, is more comfortable with taking a photo of a you know a document uh, they produced and uploading and sending it to their to their uh, tutor uh, to assess because that's just the way you know what they can use. Uh, whereas another uh, you know another student might be more um, you know uh, of more technical ability and you know is, knows how to use Google Classroom and is is comfortable at submitting you know um, reports that way and. You know, and I think um, this has this situation has allowed um, people to think quite quickly and creatively to try mm -hmm. to, you know, um, consider the, the student's particular situation and what actually, you know, how we can actually adapt. I think, as I said earlier, I think that's possibly easier for formative assessment at this stage, just because, uh, you know, um, we teaching professionals really, you know, have concerns about, you know, um, assessments that they've had in, um, you know, as exams or whatever. You can't just quickly, it's very difficult to quickly adapt that and change it into a, using an online platform. You know, that takes a lot of time and thought and, and, and lots and lots of discussions and considerations. And I think um, we just aren't in in the UK. We aren't in that situation because we've been thrown into this quite quickly. But I think you know. I think um, as we've already mentioned, I think this will come, and I think this will allow us. This is almost like this day one, I guess, the starting point. This is you know where we can we can build on this. Um, but yeah, I, I think some of the you know the the uh, the personalised learning, the personalised assessment, the differentiation. Um, solutions that can be seen are really something quite exciting and you know i think um you know that will go forward and 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 you know we will look at ways of assessing students um much more based on you know their their uh, their individual circumstances and so on and so forth um yeah so that's quite an exciting outcome i think uh, coming to you, uh, Nadir, just uh, if any additional, anything extra you feel that, uh, you know, we can add on to that. Uh, I will try. My colleagues, the, everyone on the panel have already mentioned uh, specifically with what is happening, especially with uh, Sulafa in terms of summative and formative assessment. Uh, prior to the lockdown, we used formative assessments uh, to gauge the students' uh, learning to show them uh, what they had learned, what they could do better, what areas they need to improve upon. And then we use the summative as a measure of their achievement. So we had confidence in awarding, awarding them the grade and uh, getting them to pass the subject area. It's no longer the case. Uh, we cannot do summatives online uh, simply because we, have, we do not have the controlled environment. So we do not know what the students have around them when they ask me, uh, is the test closed book? I say, yes, it is. 
it is meant to be. But I cannot see what you have around your uh, mm -hmm. computer when you're doing the test. So we've moved away from summative and we now rely mostly on formative, but also on tutorials. Uh, it is no longer about having one test or one exam at the end, which uh, they will do. Uh, unless they do their tutorials throughout the course, uh, they will not get to do their formative assignment. So the tutorials are there to show us that they're actually carrying out the work. And then they do the formative. Now, uh, again, formative is very much paper-based in majority of the cases. But in engineering, we have a whole host of resources available to us in terms of simulation and also uh, mm -hmm. YouTube. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, introduced a fantastic method to the rest of us where we would, uh, as, a, as, a, as one of the tests, we would show them, we would say to them, watch this YouTube, give them the link during the exam or the test, and then uh, we will ask them questions based on the information that was provided in the YouTube, uh, in, in the video. So we are becoming much more innovative as well. And luckily our qualification authority is giving us some leeway to move on as well. And again, uh, we have been banging on the doors for many years in terms of uh, e-learning and uh, project-based learning. And now the qualification authorities normally takes them five to seven years to come up with new ideas and approve. Yes. Now they're doing it within one year. And in fact, they, they are pushing us forward as much as they can. So we want it done for September and we keep saying, no, uh, it cannot be done. We need to create pilot programs. We need to run it, make sure it's equitable for everyone. Yes. And uh, I think it, uh, it was Gina or Hazel who mentioned, I think it was Hazel who mentioned consistency. Uh, at the moment, each department, each, uh, uh, not so much each department, each organization and institution is doing their own thing. We need to be consistent. So when we have a graduate from our organization, uh, that qualification is worth the same weight as graduates from other organizations. Good. We are moving on. Good. Thanks, thanks, Nadir. Consistency, yes, I can understand. That's a key point in uh, assessment, uh, maintaining the uh, uh, common assessment methodology. So Sulafa, how do you think, what's your uh, view on the uh, vocational institutes, how effectively they can uh, um, use assessment methods? Yeah, I'll try to keep it short, not to go that long, but uh, you know, like my colleague already mentioned, um, different things. I feel that um, evidence-based assessment is, is where all the vocational institutions should go. Mm -hmm. uh, especially because the purpose of assessment is to provide students with guidance, as we all know, and encouragement and uh, to develop their self-assessment. So if you want to consider um, if you want to consider this, we need to provide them with information about their competencies to ensure that they are achieving where we want them to achieve. So and the skills requirement and the objectives for their learning. So uh, uh, if we want to achieve certain purpose, so we need to consider that support the students, make sure that students are receiving the appropriate guidance and encouragement and helping them to be tested based on the evidence that they provide for us of their work, of the acquisition of the skills that are, they are taking or the learning outcomes that they are working on. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's, that's perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Sonata. Uh, now, if I can uh, move on to the next question, which is, and uh, Jenny, I can turn to you first. Uh, a brief uh, 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 information about what limitations and barriers can we encounter while implementing uh, remote assessment strategies. If you can just give us a brief idea about that. No. Yeah, uh, uh, very, very quickly on this one. Um, it, it really is, uh, my question back is who is sealing the potential of the learner when this happens? So it is it's practices that are now have been really tested, been proved to be broken. Um, in Australia, uh, there, is n there is not supposed to be a prevention of a student being able to attain their qualification using a flexible model. Um, every, every training authority, all they have to do is note the moderation of, of, of the change they actually had to, to make as long as that's recorded. However, it's still happening. Students are getting a, a, a note that they have completed their academic, but not their, their practice. And so they haven't got their full certificate. So there is a, a process that they can go through to pursue that. Um, 
it's coming back to current limitations, which are under review by our national gov government. And I hope we wouldn't be uh, having to answer that question within two years time. Thanks, thanks, Jenny. Uh, Gina, what's your view on that? Um, yeah, um, yeah, it's an interesting question. And I think, uh, you know, you could really list quite a long um, set of bar barriers and limitations. Um, but, you know, to try to be positive, I guess, I think, mm. Um, one of the things that really is fundamental is guidance. And, and I don't think that's any different to, um, you know, when we're talking about traditional assessment methods. It's the, the, gui the, the guidance, um, you know, for students to understand how to undertake assessments is, is, is critical here. And, you know, we are talking about um, guidance that, you know, probably teaching professionals haven't, some of them won't be as comfortable with because that would include how to use the technology um, and that's you know that's something that um, as Jenny said I, I'm sure in two or three years time that you know we'll be much more savvy and there'll be you know um, a lot more sharing of practice so that you know teaching professionals have, haven't got to start you know rewriting you know guides on how to use google classroom or different features in the vle you know those things are out there and, and and easily shared and available um but i think yeah i think probably one of the greatest limitations at the moment in the uk is probably that guidance is 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 lacking or it is you know it's there but it's probably with people that are already um comfortable with using um online and blended learning and you know the 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 majority sort of you know i suppose a lot lots of teaching professionals aren't as comfortable and therefore need access to this guidance um but I'm, you know i'm sure it's because we are we're in, un, in unprecedented times and you know we are you know very much looking for ways to ensure that this particular you know these two particular years the students aren't um you know they're not they're not um suffering or they're not you know losing opportunities or it's not unfair you know the main principle of, uh, of assessment and I think um you know in, in hopefully in two or three years time we won't have the issue where um students haven't got accesses acts to work access to vocational workplaces and I think that will you know that will really make a difference because they cannot you know they can use um blended learning they can use the technology but also they will have access to um, those critical workspaces where they can get those practical elements. So I suppose we've got to recognise that we're in an unprecedented situation and that, you know, hopefully will, will change quite quickly um, in the coming year. Um, and, um, you know, therefore we, you know, we've got, um, you know, lots to, to look forward to, I guess. <laughs> Thanks, you know, thanks. Uh, and uh, Solapa, what's your view on that? You know, um, in fact, I think the, the difficulties that they might face most is the validity and manageability of the assessment and the learning engagement in the assessment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like students might face difficulties doing their tests and some of them might not really feel engaged into doing some mm -hmm. online testing or e-assessment, which is... Uh, which needs really lots of support. And as Gina mentioned, it needs lots of guidance. Uh, we need to work on assessment strategies that stimulates and guides competence development rather than just assigning a final grade. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most important key issues that we forget as uh, uh, sometimes as educators is the feedback, which is quite important. Mm -hmm. It should be compulsory for all teachers providing students with relevant information during their learning process or even after their testing during their formative activities, it's a quite a challenge. We need to encourage our students to use the feedback so that they can transform their learning. And they can come up, they feed forward to us on what they think are the areas that they need to work on and how they can improve. So the main issue that we need to consider is to have really um, the, guide students through the assessment and ensure that it is a type of stimulating assessment that students would be 
fully engaged in and they feel that it's a part of their uh, their own development because if they feel that's only for a final grade and it's not going to be have an impact later on their work and on their practical um, skill mm -hmm. approval so they're not going to really um, be fully engaged in it mm -hmm. so part of it is to ensure that our students are well guided through their assessment and at the same time giving them the the, uh, the appropriate feedback that would help them to develop. Thanks, Salafa, thanks. And uh, Hizal, uh, what, do you, uh, what do you see could be a limitation? Uh, Very much agree with the last comment there. I think engagement is hugely important. And I think that's mm -hmm. making the assessment of value that the student can see and recognize as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really important and something that they can reflect on. And certainly in terms of the, the online and the project-based type of assessment, mm -hmm. it does give a lot of scope for reflection and ongoing development, but, but that's a dialogue and that's engagement. And I think it's really important that the assessment process mm -hmm. and the learning outcome comes are really embedded in a dialogue of engagement, which is ongoing and sustained. Another issue is just the practicalities. I, I think now more than ever, our colleagues in IT support have become hugely important. Uh, staff are, are gaining skills that, and, and confidence in what they haven't done before, but also for students. And no student should experience more stress because they're, they're grappling with the technology as well as the actual assessment outcomes uh, for their subject area. So that, that support and understanding of how they engage with the technology. Yeah. And having that ongoing dialogue with mm -hmm. with their tutor uh, and, and, and lecturers to keep the engagement, mm -hmm. and that that makes the course. I think the long term learning that can come out from that is is really valuable. But it's it's an ongoing process, and I think the the main thing with any assessment has always been that it's a true reflection of the learning that needs to be gained, mm -hmm. and we need to keep that criteria firmly in mind at whatever we're doing it is representative of the learning that's necessary. I think also it's important that employers are involved with that uh, and, and understand the value of assessments uh, so that they have confidence in what the student is being assessed on, that that is relevant to, to what they need in the workplace. So making sure that everybody is involved in that process so everyone has the right awareness and the knowledge about what's going on and understanding yeah. of what's actually being assessed is really important. And I think that's an ongoing dialogue that, that needs to be built in. It's been difficult up to now because things have been moving so quickly. And I think it's credit to everyone in the sector that they have kept going and we have been able to sustain learning. But, but we also need to unpack that as well, reflect on it and make sure that the right communications are continued uh, to really make the, the most of that uh, ongoing. Uh, great, great. Thanks, 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 Hazel. And uh, quickly uh, to you, Nade, uh, what's your view? Uh, so far, we've talked about learning, the formal learning assessments and so forth, but I think the, ma the major drawback has been in terms of the informal learning, the social interaction, the emotional interaction that the students have with one another and with us as educators they can no longer go to the canteen during their breaks and have their lunch together. They eat their lunch in their own room separately. And that is where the informal learning is lacking. We learn mostly by watching from watching one another, learning from one another how to do, not just how to learn, but also how to behave, how to become part of the society. And that has been the greatest impact of the lockdown, that we are all now individuals rather than members of the group. Virtual groups are fine. I can provide virtual activities for them, but it's not the same as sitting next to one another, helping one another out. And that is the greatest drawback in my mind. And again, as a lecturer, as a as an educator, I, I miss that interaction. I miss being able to uh, interact with my students on a personal level, seeing their faces, seeing how they follow when they smile or when they look puzzled when they don't follow. I don't need to ask them anymore. I know how, what, whether they're following me or not by just watching them and being able to make that relationship with, with them. That is where we are lacking. 
that's that's uh, that's that's one of the key points actually being being myself in higher uh, uh, education industry i miss that interaction with students face to face yeah. that's that's really good you know you 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 when you interact when you talk when you are you're surrounded by it's, it's a completely different experience so yes i agree with you on that so yeah coming uh, to a very important question which i just wanted to ask is uh, some of the learners uh, you know are restricted in some of their normal job activity so i would like to move on uh, uh, now to a focus on learners that need to generate evidence for assessments in workplace so sulafa if i can come to you first yeah. so some learners are restricted in uh, in their normal job activities and they struggle to get that evidence uh, uh, from their uh, workplace so how can we overcome this just a brief uh, if you could just give us a brief uh, idea about uh, how can yeah. we overcome this scenario Now recently uh, learners really were worried about like generating evidence for um, the the learning objectives that they are working on the skills that they have to prove that they have acquired and mm-hmm. as i mentioned earlier uh, in the uae they have come up with different they were creative in coming up with different programs that they could support their learner those learners we can come up uh, with uh, they have already mentioned e portfolios scenario based activities role playing simulations virtual reality programs uh, different things that students can use to provide evidence and through different applications and programs that they can do online as hazel mentioned uh, technology people have been very active recently and they provided us with different applications and programs that helped us to come up or helped learners to come up with the uh, proof of their acquisition of certain skills or the uh, certain knowledge that they are working on so uh, we have already mentioned different programs and different applications and we are still coming up with lots of new uh, um, ideas students have been really creative some of them would come up with their own uh, thoughts their own ideas and they would apply it to show evidence of their work it's the, it's that we just need to give them the freedom and give them uh, the push that they can do it and they will be able to come up with lots of creative ideas Thanks, Salafa. And uh, Nadi, what's your view on that? Uh, in terms of uh, the problem we encounter with them being able to do the task, uh, my main point is screen share. Uh, I either screen share with my students or I ask them to sh- screen share with me so I can see their activities, I can see what they're doing. Now, a lot of uh, the programs, some of the programs that we use are very expensive to purchase. So our students will not have access to those. So the only way we can do is, uh, as lecturers, we've got uh, this, the programs. So we will uh, demonstrate that uh, screen share with them, and then we will give them the control of our screen, where they can use that program and demonstrate to us the competencies in constructing the circuits, in uh, developing the process, whatever it may be. So that is the main point that we use in terms of competencies. If they have access to the labs, uh, fair enough. In at uh, their work, if they can go to their work and do that, again we can watch them live via their phone and other programs, or they simply uh, audio take audio visual recordings of their activities, and as uh, Solofa mentioned, becomes an e-portfolio. Logbooks are very important to us now. We rely heavily on logbooks. as uh, evidence of their activities and also finally it's being able to see them one on one discuss the discuss the problems with them and one thing we do use is a uh, verbal assignments or or other verbal assessments we do we do we still have to have assessments uh, in order to prove that they have done the task they understand the subject area but we cannot be sure how uh, so think this uh work is so what we do is after the assessment once we've marked the paper in the following week we pull each individual separately into another meeting room into a breakout room and we ask random questions about a certain one or two questions to see that they have understood the question and that the work that they produced is their own work they haven't simply copied it uh, by explaining to us verbally 
we can then be sure that the work that they've done is their own, even if they've just copied it, but at least they understand it. Okay. Fine. Thanks, thanks, Nadir. And uh, Hazel, what's your view on that? I think, I think the opportunity for verbal feedback and verbal reflection uh, and assessment feedback is actually hugely important when you're in a distanced and virtual environment. I think it's very beneficial for the student and it, it, it helps with engagement and interaction, which is missing because so much is now not face to face. So I think as much as possible, and in a way the further education sector has always been quite good at this because they're a sector that has been involved in continuous mm -hmm. assessment and project-based learning. It's the digitalization of that assessment process mm -hmm. that we've had to do very quickly. And that has been the challenge. But I think using digital platforms to engage in discussion where you can really get an, a, an overall sense, assess mm -hmm. an overall sense of how the student is presenting and reflecting is actually a very, very good way um, to pinpoint that the key learning object objectives has been assessed. And I think actually feeding back into formative things, the opportunity for that discussion actually helps retention and attainment because the student needs that engagement. And one thing that I think is key from this is that in, in, in online programs, we, we still need to make sure that for mental health and well-being and retention, that, that we have that engagement facility. I think it's very good for the detail of how an assessment is being done and, and to get the right feedback from the student. But I think it's also quite a supportive thing for students too. And um, I think that's something that we should really value um, as a key part. We've moved a long way in the COVID period. Prior to COVID, so many online learning platforms were handouts, saved on a file share, uh, and at best some recorded things. But we've now moved it into a much more live and interactive medium. And I, I hope that there is a good positive legacy effect on that, that the digital platforms have become much more dynamic and engaged, because I think that's a key thing that we would want to keep going forward to retain. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thanks, thanks, Hazel. And uh, Gina, quickly, how do learners overcome this? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try and be quickly uh, brief. I think there's, I think there's a um, two key considerations here in, in the practical elements. You've got obviously um, the soft skills, the transferable skills, the graduate attributes of higher education. They can all, all nicely be replicated with technology. So if we take the obvious example of team building, for example, you know we can continue to use, you know, the features. Um, you know, lots of creative solutions to um, and, and case studies and, and stu you know, students can, um, you know, quite uh, easily replicate those uh, assessments of, of something like team building um, for, through using technology. The difficulty comes with the technical skills um, and those practical technical skills. So, for example, you know, in hospitality, you know, can um, can students use um, certain types of equipment, systems, practical cooking skills, etc. That's not easy to uh, replicate in this situation. Um, you know, certainly with the workplaces, um, you know, if we take the hospitality industry, it's pretty much um, shut down at the moment in the UK. So obviously that, you know, those technical skills are um, you know, something that really, you know, there are, I guess there are ways around it, you know, if it was practical cookery, students can create dishes at home and, you know, take photos and so on and so forth. There are, you know, there are inroads into it, but I think that is, it's the technical skills. And as Hazel mentioned earlier, you know, one thing that we probably is going to be uh, um, a, a big consideration is, you know, when these students complete their courses, are employers going to feel that they have um, those abilities because, you know, they haven't had those um, practical learning um, and assessment um, elements available in their courses. So it's going to be interesting to see how um, employers are, um, you know, um, approaching this. And, um, and also on a positive note, I think employers will uh, again look at ways that they can help and engage and you know obviously one of the great things about having the internet is students um, have access quickly 
to uh, you know um, employer websites, and then you know they can um, in, you know can get rich sources of information about the real world out there through uh, through technology. So there's you know there's lots of positive negatives, but I do think the um, the, the technical um, aspects of assessment are um, particularly in the UK, you know, in our current situation, are you know are quite a limitation. Thanks, thanks. And lastly, Gina, what's your view on, uh, sorry, Jenny, what's uh, your uh, view on that? Yeah, um, just just to quickly add, I think uh, as uh, what everybody said is is absolutely correct. And, and just to highlight the, the point of partnerships in the, the VET process. So um, as has always had to happen for our rural and remote students and our students with different abilities, there has always been an adjustment or accommodations on how they demonstrate and perform tasks in different places and spaces. And part, a strong part of that partnership has been the community and, and the business, not only where the student is actually doing their practicums, but also other businesses that are prepared for the student to uh, demonstrate or perform tasks, but just in a different workplace, in a different, in a different setting. So it's about actually take uh, free thinking, the opportunities for students to demonstrate not just one skill in one way in one place but to actually start to really think creatively about where these students may learn be able to use these schools in multiple places and actually providing free a number of choices of pathways for students to for, to demonstrate what they can do which is a higher level of capability anyway thanks uh, thanks jenny on this and uh I would like to move on to a final question for today. And uh, Nadi, if I come to you first, uh, based on what we have learned uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, how do you think assessment methodologies may change in the near future and beyond? Uh, we are already active with that with Scottish Qualification Authority here in Scotland. The fact that uh, we are developing new generation qualifications and we are moving away from uh, assessment-based teaching into project-based. Uh, we are getting rid of quite a few of the modules and we are developing new modules and it will be much more based on uh, activities rather than, uh, as I said earlier, remembering and regurgitating the information. Uh, we are moving away from final assessments to uh, continuous uh, assessments in terms of assignments uh, project-based learning, and we're also overlapping units now. So basically one unit will complement another. So students move from one module to another, but there is a relationship between those modules. So when they finally get their qualification at the end, they have a qualification which is holistic rather than each module being separated uh, on, based on its own uh, requirements. So in engineering, we want to uh, move on to uh, what we call 21st, uh, 20, 21st century learning design. And it's very much about knowledge construction now, rather than uh, participating in uh, knowledge development. So we want to move away from what, where we were. And in, in a sense, this COVID-19 has forced us into that situation. So now rather than us pushing the qualification authority, it's the other hand, the qualification authority is pushing us to develop uh, the new learning styles so that we match the 21st century requirements. Just one point, uh, the old days are finished. We, in, we used to teach formulas, ask them to apply it and uh, regurgitate it on a piece of paper. Uh, now the information is there. They, they don't need to remember formulas anymore. Uh, with one click on the internet, they can find any bit of information any formula that they require. Now, what we want them to do is to be able to apply those information, apply the formula into real life scenarios. Uh, and the technology has moved on. And also uh, the learning has moved on. Uh, what we used to teach our students was from the, uh, about the previous century, but the technology now, uh, Internet for uh, uh, Industry 4.0, uh, it's totally different than what we had before. So we have to move on with it as well. Okay. 
Thanks, thanks, Nadir. And uh, Jenny, uh, what's uh, your view on that? Yeah, it's um, it's it's the, it's the time for many many things to happen. Um, one is um, in rethinking our assessment methodologies is what it is we are ass uh, assessing. So there is a discussion here in Australia about coming back and, and really looking at the design of competencies and the qualifications that will reflect what is required in the current and future workplace. Um, and to do that with our industry and other partners um, and really looking beyond what is actually the world of work to um, making sure that our students will be able to succeed in future labour markets. Once that's clearly understood, and of course that's uh, like a, um, a ball of string, um, then thinking about different sorts of assessments, um, partnering with industry, businesses, the professions to actually think about what they may look like in multiple ways, um, looking at the moderations of what, what that would be with government bodies, and really starting to look at the levels of proficiency for, for higher VET qualifications because a student should be able to demonstrate and show all the extraordinary things they can do in their learning, learning portfolio or whatever it is, um, which provides them for multiple pathways where they may be doing a cross secondary, vet, tertiary, university course within a matter of two years, uh, depending on the, their pathway of work that they want to go in. And at the moment, the school, the restrictions around the, the, the directional transactional way they have to do this is in giving them the agility to be able to get to the place of work that they want to be in. And with that, really thinking um, how we empower our educators to be work, walking in that journey and to be future ready now. And what do we need to put back uh, in place for not only our leaders of the learning, but our teachers to enable this to happen with business and industry. Thanks, Jenny. And uh, quickly, Gina, what's your view on that? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll, be, I'll try and be brief. I think probably there's two words that spring to mind for me in, in terms of assessment and the future. I think one is variety. I think that, you know, as uh, education professionals, we've always been, um, it's always been embedded the importance of, you know, a variety of assessment for engagement and motivation and various other reasons. I think this, this has really... Uh, allowed uh, us an opportunity to see more and more what's possible and I think that going forward will mean that there'll be a, a wider variety of assessment and the second word really is creativity I think uh, you know we've, we've uh, uh, forced almost forced our teaching professions to, to professionals to be come up with creative solutions and I think going forward um, I hope that you know many of them will continue to uh, you know, not, not put those aside and, and continue on those uh, they've, those journeys that they've had to take um, of finding creative solutions and, and seeing how that can embed in practice. So, yeah, I think there's a it's going to be it's going to be an interesting um, future, really. I guess, um, and you know, I think we're going to um, a lot a, a lot of new practice is going to springboard from these um, you know from this negative situation that we find ourselves in. Yeah, thanks, Sheena, thanks. Uh, uh, Salafa, how do you think uh, things may look in the future? Now, um, I just need to mention something that like, even though at the time being, we don't have scientific evidence of the impact of the different forms of e-assessment on the student's outcome. And I still, we still need a little bit of time to get those authentic and valid results on the effectiveness of this type of assessment. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty clear that the world is heading toward adopting e-assessment in the different sector mm -hmm. of education. The UAE has been a leading country um, in the area in adopting e-learning and e-assessment and the application, the fast application of it, and they're coming up with different programs to support it. And the Minister of Education has already mentioned that e-learning and e-assessment is going to remain part of the educational system even after the pandemic. So I think with looking at the future, it's going to be part of the educational system. Great, great. Thanks, Solapa. And uh, lastly, Hazel, what's your view on that? Uh, I, two words Gina mentioned, variety and creativity, mm -hmm. I think hugely important. We've always had that with formative work, but I think our, our, our teachers and assessors have been somewhat limited 
with assessment. So I would hope that assessment becomes much richer and broader mm -hmm. and more flexible. Mm -hmm. That is time. We need time to make sure it's appropriate and consistent. But it would be good to see that wider range uh, to support students and to support them flexibly at all stages of their learning. That will need dialogue and ongoing dialogue between institutions, though. Dialogue between further and higher education and with employers to ensure that the understanding and the progression routes are, are clear and there's a raised awareness about the, the possibilities and potential that assessment has going forward to be much richer and wider. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Hizil. Uh, well, we have come to the end of our discussion and on behalf of AP Education, I would like to take the opportunity to thank our panel, uh, Dr. Hazel Hin, Dr. Sulafal Khatib, Gina Jabala, Nadir Jamuz, and Jenny Lewis. Really thank, uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for, your, thanks for sharing the information uh, and uh, the knowledge and experience about assessment methodologies and its impact on vocational qualifications. I'm sure our audience uh, and uh, the other team that has been watching this really will benefit from this. And uh, thank you everyone for watching uh, our discussion panel today and see you next time. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.